54 points last night. We haven't seen him this hot since his son was born. So, Richard, what got into Van Vliet last night? Did he have another kid? What's happening? Richard is stunned into silence. That might be the only time in the history of television that Richard Jefferson has not had anything to say. Welcome to The Jump. I am Rachel Nichols, joined by, indeed, NBA champ Richard Jefferson, okay. two-time WNBA All-Star, co-host of the Cheney and Golick Jr. show on ESPN Radio, Cheney Agumake. Her microphone is working. Just saying. That's all. Coming up in this show, We're here. how much did the early season struggles of Anthony Davis matter? David McMenamin is going to join us to discuss that a little later on. First, though, you know the Oprah Winfrey meme? You get a car, and you get a car, and you get a car. That's what a lot of Nets basketball has felt like since the James Harden trade, and not just for KD, Kyrie, and James, who have proved positively lethal together offensively, but really for anyone on court with them. Bradley Beal, Colin Sexton, Bam Adebayo. You get a basket, you get a basket, you get a basket. All of which only ramped up the anticipation going into last night's game between Brooklyn and the Clippers. Kawhi Leonard and Paul George have both been on a tear this season and certainly capable of matching the Nets' firepower, while also remaining two of the best lockdown defenders in the league. Is this where the Nets' bounty would finally run out? Would Oprah abandon them? The short answer? Nope. <laughs> Kyrie scored 39 as Brooklyn beat L.A., with the Nets showing off some improving late-game execution and a little trickeration to boot. Hurst first Kyrie, then Harden, then KD, and all three of these shots hit over Nick Batum, who, yeah, had a rough fourth quarter. Now, Marcus Morris would help the Clips answer with a three-point play. And then we got PG. Take a look at this knockdown dazzler. But it wasn't enough. With just seven on the clock, Ka Kawhi shooting his free throws, you can see coach Steve Nash telling Jeff Green, leak toward the basket. By the time LA realizes what's going on, Harden had thrown the West unselled outlet, Green converts, and yeah, that's the ball game. Sorry, Reggie Jackson, you're not gonna make it in time. And the Nets win. But again, that's the short answer. If you want to take a longer, more deep dive, go back to the second quarter when it was the Clippers who were up 11 and the Nets who called timeout. During the break, you could see several of the players having intense conversations, discussions that KD would later reveal had to do with team defense and how some of the Nets were overhelping, leaving the three-point line vulnerable. Brooklyn came out of that timeout and promptly went on a 12-2 run, proving that when this team wants to drill down and focus defensively, they're capable of it. Or how about the three-minute stretch of the fourth quarter? The Nets held the Clippers scoreless. You can watch Harden on Lou Will. You can watch Harden on Kawhi. You can watch Brooklyn as a whole, forcing the best three-point shooting team in the league into taking tough shots that just did not fall. And this was serious progress for the Nets. And you could tell after the game that they knew it. It wasn't nothing easy, I'll tell you that. I think they, they earned every point late in the game, and that's what we want at the end of the day. It's going to be on the defensive end. Offensively, we're one of the best teams that, you know, in this league. You know, it's, it's, this can be man up, it can stop individually. And then, you know, as uh, you know, our principals, can we have each other's back on a consistent basis? We'll keep cleaning up, we'll keep getting better. But when they put forth the effort like they did tonight, it will be tough to beat. In fact, Kyrie Irving was feeling good enough about what this game indicated long term for the Nets that he said this. You know, we know that they're in contention for. Uh, you know, meeting us down the line. So we wanted to come out and make an impression. I felt like we did that. Can't knock the confidence. And look, Kyrie is not saying there that the Nets are finals ready now. This is one game, a game in which the Clippers did not have one of their better defenders in Patrick Beverly, a game in which Paul George would later complain he wasn't getting enough respect from the officials who only awarded him one trip to the free throw line. But it was also a game in which the Nets proved to themselves that, yes, they may be Oprah Winfrey on offense. But defensively, they can be something at least a little bit closer to Samuel L. Jackson in Pulp Fiction. You know, and I will strike down upon thee with great vengeance and furious anger those who attempt to poison and destroy my brothers. Yeah, that would be quite a combo if they can get more consistent at pulling it off. Richard, I know that my Samuel L. Jackson impression is so fantastic. You can barely speak after that, but try. Uh, did that win over the Clippers last night change your opinion of the Nets defense at all? 
No, no, I wouldn't say that it was anything about changing my uh, my opinion. You know, I, I, we know that there are capable defenders. There are people. There's a difference between not defending and being and really not having the ability, and then being capable. Kevin Durant is a capable defender. You look at James Harden; he has improved his defense, considering that it was such a criticism of him the last like two or three years. He's actually improved. And Kyrie Irving is a is a uh, is a type of defender that can give you moments, if not long moments, and stretches of quality defense. But it's the team defense. You don't have to be great individual defenders if you can be a good team defensive group and I think that's one of the conversations that they said that they were having and it's true if they're a solid team defense then it takes stress off of people being individual defenders yeah and that that makes sense you know I, I it really did that game changed my opinion of this Brooklyn Nets team because the Nets knew that this was a big game versus the Clippers and you know what that means we got maximum effort from all of them they were <laughs> hustling all over the floor getting out in transition obviously their defense still needs work but what I actually have really noticed over the last few games was that they're really starting to establish roles we all know that KD, Kevin Durant, is gonna go out there and get his 15 to 20 shots and be a bucket. Kyrie is gonna go and take over when rolling late in games. And now we're hearing a lot, and I don't know if you guys caught this, a lot about James Harden, the playmaker. Oh, he's a playmaker. Something he seems really comfortable being now with Brooklyn. Not in Houston, but it's all good, I digress. <laughs> Which a lot of people at first were nervous about. Will he be okay with being that guy for this team to win? Now, James Harden, he messed around and got a triple-double. He's leading the league in assists. I think 11, the next close guy is uh, Russell Westbrook with nine. As long as those three play hard on both ends, I think that they're going to be just fine because they have enough veteran savvy defensively to be able to cover those blind spots i like that you can take the girl out of houston but you can't take the houston out of the girl our texas native Cheney. and look i do think the fact that harden has adjusted the way he said he would but people were asking questions did he really mean it uh, i think that has been so huge for them i agree now as for the clipper side of things i did mention at the top there all-star paul george attempting just one free throw last night, a season low for him. And after the game, he voiced his displeasure with that. Take a listen. Um, I mean, I, I absolutely think it was disrespectful. I had one free throw attempt today. Um, I'm going to leave it at that. But the, the amount of plays I uh, initiated or created contact um, and to get sent to the line for time, uh, I mean, definitely plays I'm going to have sent in. It's funny, Cheney, when we talk about stars getting calls, you have a court with five huge all-stars on it. But do you think PG has a legit right there? <laughs> Okay, so time for us to nerd out. You know I love to do that, Nerd Nation. Now, statistically, Paul George and Kawhi Leonard, they pretty much had the same game. Points, field goal attempts, assists, and rebounds. But the difference is that, obviously, Paul George, you know, only had one free throw to Kawhi's nine. And I feel like right now we really need to put some respect collectively as an NBA family back on Paul George for a moment here, y'all. Because what he's been doing this season has been great. And I'm going to include the referees, too. He should get the benefit of the doubt because he's shooting, what, 45% from three. He's shooting, I think, making like four threes a game on pace for a 50-40-90 season. So right now, I am giving him the benefit of the doubt. Now, of course, you know, as an athlete, we always, you know, should get the foul calls. But I do think that one free throw is very different, you know, compared to Kawhi, who had nine. This guy mixes it up in the paint. So I see why he was mad. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree, Chene. I, I think, you know, the, the the point that you make, Rachel, is like, yo, there's five all-stars on that court. So if he's driving against Kevin Durant and you want respect on your name, well, Kevin Durant has respect on his name also. So, you know, when you look at this, uh, I, I think... Paul George is having a great season. He has, you know, regardless of all the conversation this summer, how their season ended last year, I think he's having a very, very good season. He's doing a great job for the Clippers. But ultimately, if you get so battled up in this free throw stuff, and I think he said it the right way. He was like, yo, I feel like it's disrespectful to shoot one free throw given the amount that I attack, the amount that I, uh, you know, how aggressive I am. That is the best way for you to say it. You're not, in, you know, pointing out, you're not cussing, you're not saying all this stuff. Saying You're just saying, I feel like it's disrespectful. I attack way too much. And everyone looks around and like, 
Well, yeah, he does play 39 minutes and attack way too much to shoot one free throw. Just statistically, that's almost impossible. Although, Richard, you've had experience arguing with officials before. How does it usually go when a player argues with an official or argues about not getting enough fouls? Well, well I, I think that's what I said. I think he did it the right way. I okay. think he did it the right way right there. I don't. I doubt it. he's going to get fined. I doubt it. You know, but it, I, I think you go back and you look at the film, and I think after the game, it's always about emotion. And then you go back and you look at the film, and you're like, okay, was there four or five calls? We're not sitting here talking about that should have been a foul on Paul George in the final two minutes of the game. We're not saying any of that. We're just saying that, like, over the course of the game, he should have shot more free throws. But you got to go back and watch the game and say, okay, there's three or four times there where they legitimately missed the call. And I just don't know. I think a lot of them were judgment calls, and the judgments just didn't go his way that night. But given who he is and given how much he attacks, you would imagine that that there should be more one more than one free throw under his belt. Well, we'll see what happens in the next game for sure. All right, guys, coming up, we'll listen to what Fred Van Vliet had to say after that incredible night last night. Pulp Fiction, Richard. <laughs> okay, the, 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 that ship has sailed. But that's a classic. But that's a classic. <laughs> like, you can quote classics without dating yourself. <laughs> Downtown no. Julie Brown references, though. That's too much. <laughs> Yeah, that's, that's that's too much. That's, that's too not much. pop culture. That's not relative pop culture. <laughs> yeah, Miss, I, I didn't know that one. I was going to say, Janae, way too young for that one. But Richard's old, so he knew. Miss Duncan, Kyrie had a pair of Redick finishes against the Clippers. Richard, you got to see a lot of uh, his uh, Rod Strickland, I'm, I'm, uh, Godfather. Sorry. Yeah. I said, what did you say? God yeah, poppy. Yeah, yeah, I no. don't know why. There's something wrong with me. <laughs> It, and look, look, Kyrie. <laughs> look, I, look, I said it. To, I, I said it the other day, and it's different. Kyrie and AI are the two best small finishers I've ever seen. I know a lot of people were talking about Derrick Rose, and yes. he's in that. I would put Derrick Rose top five, but those guys no, are the yeah. top two, in my yeah. opinion. Yeah, and you can see all the Strickland influence. Yeah, then. Kyrie's handle. Yep, for mm -hmm. sure. As someone who is a childhood mm -hmm. bullet fan, I'm just saying. All right, make mm -hmm. boosties. Yeah, I'm with you. Let's look at Blazers Wiz. Dame driving past Russell Westbrook and then packs it. You know he enjoyed this, too, with all the trash talk between the two of them over the years. And then let's go to the Bay because Kelly Oubre dunking it over Tristan Thompson. So, Chanae, which was the better baseline bang out? So, I like oh, Kelly tight. Oubre because it was with the left. Ooh. But I'm always team Dame Dollar, Dame Time. And when Dame does it from three, it's great. But when he dunks on you, it's like the double whammy. Can, can I, this is what I'm saying. I know that you know this, but he's left-handed. I know that you know this, but Kelly Oubre dunking with his left hand, yeah, like he's no, left-handed. So I'm not saying that you don't know that. I know you know that, but it's like that doesn't make it more impressive. But him dumping, right, like dunking over left. a big like that. I always feel like if someone's smaller, well, Tristan Thompson is over a big. Tristan Thompson is not you that big. You don't see it from that angle. Daniel that whole, Tristan's this like six foot five. From that angle that much. <laughs> Miss boxing out. <laughs> Raptors magic off the miss three. Cole Anthony flew in there for the putback. Richard, why didn't anyone put a body on that man? Look at him. Because point guards don't ever box out. Because point guards are supposed to get back. So the like, so if you're on if you're on defense and you go you go to like bot, like you go to get a rebound point. That's how point guards always get these triple doubles, man. Like Russell, like Russell Westbrook mm -hmm. and Jason Kidd. They never box out. They just go get the rebound. And then until a point guard goes and gets that, that's when you start to be like, okay, I got to box him out now. <laughs> Are you complaining I was about there playing for with that Jason Kidd? And it was oh, amazing. Oh, cool. Nice. Yeah, in person it looks better. And and now we're in the portion of the show where Richard complains about having Jason Kidd as a teammate. Make disrespect, Baylor, Texas. Yeah. <laughs> no? Yes. Greg Brown collecting the pass, no. throws down the poster, gets teed up. Richard, though, you've got to think the tech was worth it, though, right? Baylor ended up winning by double. Hundred percent. If you it, it's always about time and score. If you get a dunk and a technical, it's 100% worth it. There's a level of intimidation. There's a level of fire. So I am perfectly okay with it. Well, Richard, it's funny. You should say I feel that. Like we... Go ahead, Tanae. Go ahead, Rach. No, no, no. No, it's all good. All you. I, I just, I remember one of Richard's most famous dunks where there was a tech oh. involved. Tanae, you remember Christmas Day, 2016. Oh, too soon, too soon. <laughs> I do. Uh, 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 listen, what you know? The funniest thing about that is I only had four points in that game, and there were two dunks. 
Uh, so when I finally got on the board with the dunk against Kevin Durant, I just kind of looked at him like, yeah, I know you got 27, but I can dunk every now and then. Still so much respect for the big fella, though. You get to add inflation to dunks, Richard. So that it's more than four points. Yeah, okay, you can add inflation. Yeah, the wink the wink was just more of like, yeah, I like I know you are who you are. You are who I thought you were, but I can dunk a little bit. That was all it is. And it was worth it, right? Hundred percent worth it. And because because they thought that I said something to him, even though he laughed, they thought I said something to him, so they gave me a technical, but they actually rescinded the technical when they saw that I didn't do anything. Aw, that's so nice. All right, I mean, yeah, they were so there nice. You go. The referees see, see, you treat the referees nice, they treat you back. They they, they take care of you. <laughs> I want to circle back on the incredible performance that Fred Van Vliet guys had last night in Orlando. Broke DeMar DeRozan's Raptor scoring record of fifty two. That was set back in twenty eighteen. Team Van Vliet dropped 54 points, also the most points scored ever by an undrafted player in NBA history, according to Elias. He hit 11 of his first three, uh, 12 three-pointers, 9 for 9 from the line for the game. Afterward, Fred said he was more concerned about winning than scoring. What you want to hear, right? It was easy, no disrespect to, to the Magic, but I mean, for most of those, I was open, they were in rhythm, they were clean looks, they were in, within the offense, and that's why I was able to remain patient and, and still pass out of double teams and not take bad shots because the way I got all my points, I wanted to win more than I wanted 50 points. So, you know, just trying to continue to play with a pure heart and uh, let the game come to me, come to me and, and, you know, I was rewarded for that. So, Shanae, you're in Orlando right now. You were in the building last night. What was it like sitting there in real time watching Fred VanVleet do all this? It was so much fun. I'm sorry, Becky Bonner, my girl, my Stanford sis, um, who hooked me up with the tickets yesterday. But, you know, watching this game, it was over time. You just started seeing, I'm like, okay, he's hot. Look up. All right, 20 points. He hit another couple. Oh my gosh, he's already at 40. And it's crazy because I feel like his story, what, he's a six foot guard out of Wichita State. He plays with that edge. And now the league is starting to maybe realize, especially after this game, how good his talent is. It's not tied to that one playoff run that amounted in the Raptors' first championship. He's legit. But it sort of seems like people still don't really guard him or send that crazy energy that he demands because he has been a, well, at least that game, he had been a sniper. But this season for the Raptors, he's been a sniper, leads them in scoring 20 points per game. So it was fun to watch. Um, I felt bad considering I was there, you know, on our, in honor of the Magic. But I feel like by the end of the game, everyone was really celebrating his achievement because he's a guy you can root for. The only thing I heard is, with all due respect, <laughs> they were open and good shots. It's like with all due respect, you're an idiot. You can't just, you can't just, you can't just say with all due respect and say whatever you want after that. You can't do that. That's pure Ricky Bobby. We got to understand when you say, "Well, you know, with all due respect to the Magic, I was dead." <laughs> it was dead easy. open on every single shot and they were they were in rhythm and they were pretty easy you know she's i wish i could play against with all due respect i wish i could play against the magic every night you can't say that but after you get past that look he wasn't lying and look he his story is more of a story that you should hear than the number one picks that go on to be great because that's expected right comes from a small school has won a g league championship went through the g league spent time developing these games all these first round picks that rather sit on the bench than go to the g league and work on their game look at the individuals that have worked on their game and have improved with reps your process will go a lot quicker if you just focus on playing and getting better i am a huge fan fan of Fred. Well, you know, Fred's tagline uh, is bet on yourself, right? He has that on his clothing line and everything mm -hmm. else. He's a guy who knew that he might end up at the very end of the draft. His agent put out the word to teams, you know what, this guy, don't draft him. He'd rather be an undrafted free agent, take his chances, see where he goes. He ended up signing in Toronto. The rest is history and that huge, huge deal in the offseason. Bet on yourself, people. All right, guys, coming up next, we're going to play the stat market. Should we press to dig into some numbers so you know what that means? Oh, yes, it is the stat market opening bell. We give you the stats. You buy or sell whether the trends will continue. First up, MVP Giannis Antetokounmpo, who is struggling from the free throw line this season, averaging a career worst 59%. His career high, 77%. He was 70 
two seasons ago when he won his first MVP. It has gone down since there. Richard, do you buy or sell these struggles from the charity stripe continuing through this season? Uh, I'm going to buy it. Ultimately, I, I, I think he will improve. I don't know if he's going he, I don't think he's going to go down, but I think he's still going to end up with a career worse, mainly because, you know, I think the pressure is starting to mount. And, and look, there's no fans in stadiums. You're not traveling as much. You're a little bit less fatigued. So it's like all of these things should mean your body's fresher. You're you're more familiar because you're playing like two games in one arena, right? Uh, you know, against the same team. So I just think he's going to continue to struggle. But you know, ultimately, that's why there are uh, question marks about whether the Bucks can finish. Look, he had a game where he was one for ten or one for nine. Like that's that's absurd. Like that for a guy of that caliber that works as hard as he is, that's more mental than it is physical. Exactly. I agree. That is uh, highlighting the mental aspect, especially when it comes to the free throw line. And for that reason, I'm going to continue to sell this because I feel like we all sort of bear a little bit of responsibility when it comes to Giannis Antetokounmpo and his, you know, shooting percentages. Just because, like, I think we tend to think about what he should be, not what he actually is in this moment. We all know that he's a freak athlete with good handles that cannot be stopped in the paint and can hit occasionally, you know, that mid-range that's working on his free throws. But we we all know that he will give you 30 points a night, you know, whether it is attacking the rim or just getting it in transition. And so I feel like the expectations and the conversations and are sort of forcing him to play this mental game that's probably not his best versus appreciating what he actually does well. And um, that's just getting to the rim and scoring and okay, improving but, his game over time. But today, who he is, at least for a while, was a 70 something percent free throw shooter. So we know that that's not looking for him to be something we, he can't be. It's looking for him to be what he was just a few years ago. Okay, your girl, when I started at Stanford, I think I was like a 60% free throw shooter. So I've been through the works. Your okay. girl is now at 80% Ooh. and working her way up. So some seasons it's hard. Some seasons it's, it's you know, it's easier. But this is one of those things where I think this season it just maybe has gotten into his head. And we feel like he'll get back to at least better than average. And that's not what we're seeing right now. You're giving her that stink eye, Richard. Come on. She's improving. <laughs> I, no, well, my, 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 yeah, my only thing, my only thing about it is like when you talk about bearing the responsibility, I hear you and I understand understand what you're saying but part of being a professional athlete as as you know is tuning out all the noise don't listen to what everybody else is saying his free throw line his free throw percentage was something that was a compliment to his game because he was such a, a great uh, paint attacker one of the best guys in the paint was amazing in transition and he knocked down his free throws that was like wow like he's he's shack with with, with that, that can knock down free throws but he has digressed and sometimes it is like we talked about it's always about the mental aspect of the game he should not be regressing and going backwards you know on his free throw percentage and i think no some one of it is has immune to, do to is the like struggle the only no one is immune to the struggle and everyone is like yo if the only thing that is going to stop you guys from winning your championship is the ability to either shoot outside shots or knock down free throws and his jumper is not progressing the way he would like and it's starting to affect his free throws from a mental aspect that's really just the, the cold, hard truth. Well, let's move on, guys, because we want to talk Zion Williamson also dominating in the paint. In fact, he's averaging 17.9 points per game in the paint this season. That is on pace to be the highest of anybody over the past 15 years. Janae, do you buy or sell Zion sustaining this pace? I am buying this, all of it. Like whatever game stock was happening a, a week, you know, but when it was all good, like that's the same type of thing that I'm buying. You get that energy. Now, again, like you said, Rach, <laughs> for sure, leading the league in, in points per game when it comes to the paint. He has the highest field goal percentage by any NBA player by like a long shot. And he's just now figuring out the game. Again, this could potentially be an extension of his rookie season where he only played 30 plus games. He's still figuring it out. But one thing he knows is if it ain't broke, you don't need to fix it. He's going to get to the rim at will. He's a great, he's a guy you don't have to run plays for. That's a beauty. That's heaven for a coach. And what does he do? He gets those touches. He gets those deflections. He gets extra possessions and he finishes at the rim. And I feel like that's what he's known for and that's what he's going to stick to. No, I, I agree, Chanae. I think the funny thing is like when you look at players like Ben Simmons, when you look at players like Giannis, everyone focuses on what they need to improve on. Well, right now, Giannis, or, or, excuse me, uh, Zion is in that phase where it's just like, hey, go play your game. 
go figure out your game. We're not going to critique you on whether your three-point percentage or just go play. And he's dominating in the paint. You go look at Giannis's MVP years, dominate in the paint. So I think I am 100% buying because Zion has little to no pressure other than being the number one pick and all that. He has no pressure to go prove that he can do something else <laughs> because everyone just wants to see what he's capable of right. doing before him trying to prove what he can do. Oh, I can shoot jumpers. I can do this. I can do that. Right now, it's like, hey, like you want to go and Giannis. score 18 points in the paint? Do it every night. Yeah, learn. <laughs> All right, guys, let's get to the Phoenix Suns as well. They are winning this season and doing so with defense. As you can see, they defend the three really well. Well, they rank in the top five overall in defensive efficiency. Richard, do you buy or sell the Suns as a top five defense for the rest of the season? I'm going to say I'm going to sell, but I don't think they're going to drop out of the top 10. I, I, I think, you know, the fact that they are a top 10 defensive team, the fact that they're right now, like a couple months in at, at number five means that's kind of who they are, right? Do I think they'll maintain being a top five defensive team? I think that'll be tough. But if they drop to seven, if they if they drop to eight, I, I, I think that they're still a playoff team. And I think that's a compliment to the coaching staff. I think that's a compliment to what Chris Paul has done and also all the young players that are listening to all of the defensive responses responsibilities and making sure that they do it every single night because that's what a top five top 10 defensive team does they bring it every night and, and Rach, I'm a high risk, high reward investor. Ooh. And so therefore I'm going to buy into this because I feel like based on the talent level right now in the NBA, which is so deep, we've got Brooklyn, we've got LA's plural, we've got Philly, we've got Milwaukee to compete, which Chris Paul wants to do. That's why he made this move there to compete with that type of top tier talent. I feel like the Phoenix Suns, they will need their defense as their edge. Um, Chris Paul, seven time all defensive team type of player. Um, you, you now have that rim protector in Aiton, and you have a lot of switchable wings. If I am, you know, coaching that squad, Monty Williams, I'm telling them defense is our bread and butter, and then we will let our chemistry build, and we will compete through, you know, uh, leading, you know, with Chris Paul at, at our point guard position. Well, you're making our researcher, Michael Schwartz, extremely happy, Chanae. He is a diehard Suns fan. This season, it's been a decade since they've been in the playoffs, people. This season is all he has. So thank you for buying on that, just for him. Today has to get to her radio you. show. Thank you so much, my friend, for joining us today. And that is the closing bell, meaning the stat market is done for the day. We will be back with another edition soon. Coming up, Richard's going to stick with me, Anthony Davis. Dave McMenamin in the house. Well, he's in his house. No one can be in our house right now, but we're trying, people. Dave, tell us what you've noticed about Anthony Davis over the first quarter of this regular season. Well, listen, Rachel, when statistics, he's down and scoring 3.8 points less this year than last year. If you look at all the 20 in the top 10 in terms of points going down, rebounds are down. Blocks are down. He's not playing as well as we're accustomed to. You'd think this would be a year of ascension for him coming off the championship. And that million dollar extension. To me, it's more of either a plateau or a recession. And the question is, be concerned? Or is this a guy who recognizes that it's all about postseason performance so he doesn't have to worry about it? Richard, are you concerned about AD's slower start? Ah, uh, you no, know, I'm not because you know when you when you go through that long run and you want run a championship. I'm not saying that players coast the next year, <laughs> but oftentimes you oftentimes you will see guys kind of build up, right? Just before LeBron had that that monstrous game uh, about a week or two ago, he was averaging like 22 points a game, just or, or just under 23 a game. And I, I like I text, I was like, dude, or, like what's going on? You're not going to average 25 this year? Mm. And then slowly but surely, he's been picking it up. Uh, over the last couple of weeks. And so I think a lot of times when you had such a short off season, guys aren't looking to start off the first 30, 40 games just banging their body, being super aggressive. They want to build into it. If you, I, I always notice even playing with Braun, he posts up more at
as the season progresses and as he gets into the post or as he gets into the postseason doesn't post up nearly as much in the first third of the season to kind of conserve some of the wear and tear on his body so i'm not concerned i always look at their record how their offense is and how their defense is and their the lakers offense team defense all of that stuff is is moving in the right direction so i'm less concerned with ad's individual stats well there's been some question about how much he's deferring a little bit to try to involve some of his new teammates right i mean his shot attempts even are down but the new lineups they're interesting the lakers played something in crunch time against the hawks that was pretty cool lebron trez caruso kuz and Taylor horton tucker dave what do you think of that lineup and what we will see of it going forward yeah Rachel, well, first of all we got to you know again the, Wait, the, let the, 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 speak, the richard come on <laughs> oh my bad i'm Dave sorry i thought richard. you were still I, dave's bad That's all. my bad <laughs> Were you not paying attention? Were you just going and liking those Instagram photos of, of our girl? <laughs> I, 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 I have not, pay, this I have not up, paid attention at all. It's been years. <laughs> <laughs> Lineups only uh, played 32 minutes together. Defensive lineup in the NBA this season in terms of point differential. And uh, we got to come up with a nickname, maybe the, the D5, because that group together are, are so potent defensively. They're able to. defensive deflections their end uh, because LeBron is a guy who's a freight train uh, when he's in transition and so that's a group that Frank Vogel has unearthed and Wes Matthews and Markeith Morris a really tough decision for a coach to um, take two guys who had other offers on the free agency market this past summer who came to LA to try to be part of a repeat championship group and recognize that sometimes by not playing those guys Richard, now, Dave, Dave, Dave's frozen into silence. So go ahead, my friend, <laughs> please. <laughs> oh, I can talk now? I'm allowed to talk? Okay, my I, bad. I, I, if it were uh, up to no, me, you'd be talking uh, this entire hour. But we've, no, we've... <laughs> no, 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 no. I'm, 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 just, I'm just giving Dave, I'm giving Dave a little bit of mess. Uh, no, ultimately, I, I think, you know, we talk about this so much with all the teams in the league. The first third of the season, it's all about figuring out who your new players are, how that you can, you know, get them in the system, how they're acclimating to the system. I love it when you see coaches find these random defensive lineups that can work. Uh, I, I think that gives, you know, the coach another opportunity to be like, hey, if we're playing against a really small team or if we're down 15 to start the second half, like what can I do to pick up our defense? Certain things, and because when you look around this league, there are some very potent offensive teams that you could potentially go uh, against. And so you want to be able to have very, very good defensive lineups and shout out to Frank Vogel and his staff for finding a very, very good one. Well, this was one of the reasons we love the offseason that the Lakers had so much. It just, they gave them more selves, more dexterity, right? And you saw the offensive numbers drop when yeah. they have those guys on the floor, but the ability to put in lineups that can match the situation, I think the Lakers have more of that than they did even their championship season last season, which makes them very dangerous. All right, up next, we're going to preview